Good morning, everybody. I'm John Riley. I'm recording this uh, film today for NCTV and for Massachusetts Center for the Book. I'm meeting this morning with Martha Cohen, the library director of the Belding Memorial Library here in Ashfield. It's a beautiful day, and uh, Martha has taken time uh, with the library closed to, to meet with us, so we're going to get a nice, quiet tour of the whole place. Um, Martha, can you tell us just a little bit about the history of the library, when it was built? Sure. Um, we just celebrated our 100th anniversary last year. It was built built in 1913, but dedicated in 1914. So it took about a year to build. And it was given to the town by Milo Belding, who actually was born here, but didn't spend a lot of his life here. His parents lived there their whole lives. And he, de he gave the library to the town once he'd become a well-established and um, wealthy silk manufacturer. And he gave the, the library to the town and had it built in honor of his parents. And there are plaques to both his we'll, parents we'll in the front hallway. We'll go and see hallway. those uh, before we yeah. stop. Uh, where did he have his silk mill? Well, locally? he did. He had some silk mills locally. Uh, there was a silk mill in Florence, and he mm -hmm. had some silk manufacturing in the valley. But the bulk of it was in Michigan, oh, wow. and it was in a place that now also has is called Belding, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And it was Alva Belding, his brother, who lived in, primarily in Michigan. And uh, there is also a library called the Alva Belding Library oh, in Belding, yeah, Michigan. Your sister library. Yes. I found this to be true in a lot of the libraries that I've visited so far in uh, towns is that people have left, made their fortunes, and then come back to give back to the town. Yeah, that's uh, Cummington, I uh, saw some of the same things there. Uh, obviously, uh, Conway. Uh, people, you know, came from the small little farming town, made their fortunes, and, and wanted to come back and, uh, and give back to, to their it's small town. good yeah. that they don't forget where they came from. <laughs> that's, that's really <laughs> that's good. Right. Now, uh, how did you become interested in being a librarian? When, how long have you been a librarian? When, when did you start? And oh, what well, got you started? Um, I have been a librarian for uh, almost 30 years now. Okay. And um, I it was not my first um, try at a career, <laughs> but uh, something that I came to realize um, might be enjoyable. When I was actually, after I had finished college with a degree in sociology, uh, not knowing quite what to do with the degree in sociology since I didn't want to teach, and uh, I had worked for a Ralph Nader organization, a Connecticut Citizen Action Group in Connecticut, uh, working on, uh, back then, and even cons conservation and solar issues. Mm -hmm. um, but that was kind of a 60 hour a week job and I was looking for something that was a little more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually came to, had thought about going to library school when I moved back to Boston and uh, Simmons Library School had a great reputation. And, but it took me a while to decide to go to library school. Um, I actually have an deg associate's degree in computer technology. Okay. <laughs> and that's something you really need nowadays in the library. Right? Although I have to say, by now, everything I learned is somewhat <laughs> outdated. Um, in any case, that, that, that was I got an internship at Simmons um, uh -huh. in their media lab and uh, decided that I loved being a librarian. Now, you uh, grew up here and went to school? I did. Here. I grew up in Northampton. Okay. And uh, then I went to uh, school in, at, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, and then I went to Simmons in Boston for my library degree. And you spent a number of years in Seattle. Uh, is, was that your first uh, library job? Uh, no. Actually, my first library job was at, as a... Um, a reference librarian at the Mount Holyoke College okay. for uh, probably a year and a half. And then I had um, my, one of my, my dream jobs, which was to work for the Mass Audubon Societies. Oh, yeah. And they had in a Boston. small library, yeah. and it was actually in Lincoln, okay. right outside, at, uh, across the street from Drumlin Farm at their headquarters. And I was their librarian for about four and a half years until Proposition two and a half cut mm -hmm. off a lot of money to the organization okay. and they had to cut back a lot of positions. In which case, at that point in time, we I moved to Seattle to try another uh, way across the country. To And it's beautiful out there. Yeah. And I worked for 20 years. Did you work years. in the public library? I did. I, not in Seattle Public, but I worked for the King County Library System okay. uh, in three different libraries as um, a young adult, a teen, mm -hmm. and reference librarian. Well, we're meeting in the children's room here at the library, and man, if I was a kid, I would love coming here. This looks like paradise. I mean, you got everything going on in here. 
It is. The windows are beautiful. Yeah. Do you know the story about the building of this part of the library? No, I do see that it is a new addition to your classic granite yes, building over there. Yes, that's right. It's about uh, uh, 22, 23 years old. Okay. And um, it came to be built because... Uh, a copy, one of the few copies of the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln was found in the basement of the library. And nobody Where could, was it? In it the was basement, in, just well, in I'm final? not sure. I wasn't here in Asheville. Uh, it was in the early, you know, um, right around 1991. Yeah. Who found um, it? And I don't even know who, I believe the library trustees found mm -hmm. it. And I could you know, it was identified as belonging to the library, but nobody, even with research, could find out exactly who gave it to the library. Yeah. There have been some certain guesses that perhaps Charles Eliot Norton, who was, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, used to spend all of his summers here and was a beloved um, mm -hmm. member of the summer Asheville community, might have given it to the library. And the other person with a, a status and, and money who might have had it was uh, George William Curtis, who also spent summers here. And they, we will see that we have busts of both of these we will, uh, we esteemed will men in the front on, of the library. The but that was the idea that somebody had... Um, of you know who had position and money had given it to the library as a gift. Did you put it up for auction? Or? Well, what? Yes, apparently, and this is the the um, more difficult side of this whole story. Apparently, it caused a split in town, mm -hmm. a rather deep split between those who wanted to keep it here, yeah. and for the children's education and for mm -hmm. um, you know as a. Um, showpiece and people who wanted to set, auction it off to be able to build yeah. an addition to the library. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that is what happened, that the trustees did vote to, um, to sell it. And that's why we have this beautiful children's room and the meeting room below it and certain renovations to the hallway and the lift, a handicapped lift for... Where did it end up? Where is it? Uh... It was a, it was auctioned off by, so I'm not sure who, okay. who bought so it. It was probably in a museum yes, yeah. yeah, I think so. It was, uh, it was sold for $105,000 okay. and uh, 93 or 94 uh, thousand built this edition and but it's a it, great story it, it, yeah yeah and it has taken some uh 15 20 years to, to completely heal that rift in town when i came just the, the beginning of 2014 mm -hmm. um it was it was one of the anniversaries of the um of the Emancipation Proclamation as well. And, um, you know, lots of people filled me in on the story of what had happened and um, indicated that there were people in town that were just now coming back to visit the library and be able to heal. And there, last summer during our centennial, one of the most wonderful pieces of that healing happened where a group of folks in town who were celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation and also the whole connection to of the Underground Railroad to this area and slavery and um, you know looking at, at, at racial issues in a sort of more meaningful way they actually uh, gave the library in a ceremony during our centennial a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation which we mm -hmm. now have hanging in the other room indicating that it wasn't the the, the piece of paper itself but the um, what was behind the words that could be a teaching tool, and that it was a, and, and to me that was a healing gesture. And that Asheville the town had been the part of the Underground Railroad, probably, That's right. and, and people here had supported that, uh, that That's idea right. all the way. Yeah. That's just great. Um, now, the library is right here in the center of town. Uh, how does it fit into the town? How does it fit into the community? Well, I think it's a wonderful location because um, it really is, it means that it can be part of the community yeah. without without much outreach. You have a community um, room so that for it's, people to we use. do we have a community room that we encourage people to use mm -hmm. and that anybody who wants to for educational or civic or cultural purposes use that room um, and we do not charge for that. So we want people to use the library as part of all kinds of community activities. The other thing that I should point out, and we're going to talk about the Asheville Film Festival yes. later, but within many of the films that are not specific 
specifically about the library when they scan through the town. The library doors in front are prominent in those, and it's I'm just happy a beautiful, to see it. it. It's yeah. such a beautiful building, and I was looking on your website, and you do have a, a very nice website, and with a good amount of history about the, the library, that it was built by Italian stonemasons. And it looks like it might be in Italy somewhere. It's got this classical <laughs> look to it that it yes. could be a villa somewhere. It does. Like, in it Tuscany does. or something. Um, now, what are some of the big draws here at your libraries? I know most public libraries, uh, genealogy, local history are huge. Do you have that as a We do. We have some local mission? history. Yeah. We do absolutely have that as a mission. And, you know, part of that's been helped by the fact that this uh, past year, uh, the Asheville History Project has put out the third volume. I was really impressed by the... these. Uh, you have three volumes yes. so far on the history of Ashfield. Um, you got a lot to say, and there's a lot going on here. There's so much going on. I, I didn't really realize it until I started looking uh, through your book. I mean, theater, uh, film, yes. uh, literature, history, uh, just so much. Uh, it's really uh, quite a cultural community. It is an amazing yes, town, well. yeah. And you can and, see. Uh, we can recommend this. It's, it's out now. It's $35. It's $40. $40. It's $40. <laughs> it can be purchased. Uh, here at the library. Here at the library. That's right. It's a great gift. And the the wonderful thing about this third volume, as compared to the, the you can see that the increase in technology has affected you know publishing in the yeah. library, and uh, that this was um, put together, I believe, by a wonderful Hans publisher. Hans Tinsma. Yes, in Aguam, I believe. Okay. And um, it has all kinds of pictures it that is. weren't possible with these. It's a beautiful books. book. Even if you don't buy it, you might want to get it on interlibrary loan. Yeah. to see these books um, yeah. you know not too many towns have this extensive of, of, a, of a printed history That's now you also pulled this for me I thought that this was kind of interesting can you tell me a little bit about Eva Tanguay and her oh. relationship to the library <laughs> apparently Eva Tanguay who um, was a silent film star uh, was she was born in Quebec and then has connections to many parts of the world and who knew that she had a connection to Asheville she actually owned the house that was part of the property okay. that this library is now built on and apparently she sold the house uh, in 1910 or 11 to Milo Belding and then Milo Belding demolished it and had the library built but she sold it and this is the quote from the history that I find most intriguing, um, sold it in consideration of one dollar and other good and valuable considerations paid by Milo Belding of New York City. Um, <laughs> so she was interested in it becoming a library too, I guess. You know, well, she sold it for a dollar. Yes, yeah. one hopes that she, that, that was, yeah. and she realized it was going to perhaps a good cause, and yeah. they're not going well, to. Well, Cecil B. DeMille was born here in too. Fact, you are a movie yes. capital here. <laughs> we are, we are. Yes, Cecil B. DeMille um, was uh, born uh, right across the street oh, in the Asheville housing, well, what's now. Um, a large Asheville apartment building and there's a little plaque and it was the only time he ever spent in Asheville was when he was born okay. <laughs> but he's been remembered yes. <laughs> and celebrated That's great. Um, now well, we're going to look at uh, some of your DVDs from the Asheville Film Festival that I understand were slightly inspired by Cecil B. DeMille yes. in a backhand way but yes. through Hollywood and some other connections now um, to just kind of wrap up what we're talking about, the, the actual function of the library, tell me about some of the special things that you do here. I know you do storytelling. Um, what else do you offer here in the library? That well, we do Yeah, we do offer story times on Saturday mornings mm. because for young children Who reads? and families Who does with the young children. Um, my staff and myself and oh. volunteers from the community. Oh, I'll have so to come sometime we, when you read yes, well, we, <laughs> Bring my grandson. <laughs> yeah, that's Elliot, right. Elliot that's would perfect. like to come. Two years old, and that's just about our average age. They're oh, really, really young okay. kids, very young story time. And um, it, it also becomes, because it's such a beautiful space, the, when, the, when the family members, sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's grandparents, come with their kids, they end up um, chatting with each other after the stories and talk, well, becomes a little building. community building space. That's really fantastic. And that's what we want the library to be. Um, you'll see that in, and we have, we try to encourage all kinds of programs 
programming that promotes community. Um, we actually encourage, because we're only a small staff of one librarian and two um, dedicated assistants, um, we encourage people, for community members, to bring us programs. Mm. So we have people come. I've, we encourage anyone who's written a book to come, and the library will help them advertise it and do a reading and, or, mm. or a book signing. In fact, we have Ken Condon, who is a, a resident in town, who's a motorcycle expert, and I didn't realize that. He also uses um, you know, our computer computers to download books on his computer, and that's how I would met him, um, was he... He wrote a book on being how to ride motorcycles safely and came and asked if he could do a reading and we set one up. And then we get a whole lot of people that had never been in the library before. All these motorcycle enthusiasts <laughs> wearing their motorcycle jackets. You know, again, very popular. It was great. It There's was a lot great. of doctors and lawyers riding uh, motorcycles too. Yeah. So. We also, um, thanks to our friends of the library, were able to sponsor last year a memoir writing workshop for seniors to try to be able to um, consolidate and get on paper their memories, um, whether they're of Asheville or of other parts of their lives. And that was very successful, and some of those folks are still mm. are still writing and kind of got inspired to well, I think to I see write, a volume so. four coming on the right. history of Asheville. <laughs> now, uh, you really count a lot on volunteers. Uh, I've yes, seen your volunteers at work. I come every year to your book sale yes, we uh, do. during That's the right. fall festival. And this year it was really a wild festival. I think it was the biggest one I think I've ever seen. I saw plates from Tennessee, Wyoming. It, I think you guys are on a circuit of some kind of like world's most famous fall festival towns or something because it was I, insane. I, it def, the word seems to have definitely gotten out because yeah. when I got here, people definitely said, Reserve that that weekend. Yeah. There are tons of people in town. You know, sort of save yourself a parking space. Well, it's like a movie <laughs> lot. You have the perfect setting. It's like a, a movie setting for the the festival it is right. with the architecture and the park it and is. the library and everything. It's right. like, and it's all set up close together yeah. on one you know on one road. And I also know that people you know a lot of young folks. I mean, like a small town like this, mm -hmm. they grow up here and then they leave and go other places and to to find work or to you know follow their their dreams. Mm -hmm. Dreams. But I notice on that weekend, it also seems to be a lot of people homecoming. come back to Asheville. It's a homecoming. It's I in the fall. It. It's beautiful. And many of the people that come through the library say, oh, I haven't been here for years. And I remember when this was that. And I remember the children's area was here. And oh, look at these beautiful windows. I haven't seen the new edition. And that is so, a really, yeah. really cool angle. Yeah. I understand that the book sale uh, goes a long way towards funding some special events or it things does. that you do here too. It is the the book sale is the the friends of the library run the book sale mm -hmm. for us and we were incredibly grateful to them for it. It's the major fundraiser. In fact, the two major fundraisers of the year for the friends are during the fall festival. Mm -hmm. One is that book sale and then one is a raffle that the friends run down yeah. at the town hall. And that supports the library all year round. It supports extra collections, it supports um, computer work that we need done. It's it's going to it supports and is going to, in the future, support um, gaining extra more technology for the library. Uh, they have also um, supported uh, a lot of programming. Lot well, of the secret is out. The best book sale in the Valley, <laughs> in, the, in Western Mass, is at the Building Library. And I can speak to that because I have a bookstore, and I am always number one in line. And you saved me one year with my box. And I, got to, I got to keep my place. So I now, love that book sale. More Columbus than, Day weekend. More than any that's book sale. That, that's the best. Um, now, another thing that you fund through that is uh, free museum passes, which I don't know if everybody Me knows. Too. I take Me advantage too. of them at the Forbes and at the Lilly Library. And when I tell people about it, they go, really? You can go to all these libraries for free? I said, oh, it's a, that's what libraries offer. I mean, it's an added... Yes, Bonus. it's a yeah. wonderful program that a lot of people don't know about. And yeah. each library has passes that are will be of interest to that particular yeah. area. So if um, so, I encourage people to check out their library and find out what passes they have. Um, we do also list them on our website. Yeah. But our most popular passes here are to the Clark Art yes, Museum, Clark Art yeah. Institute, Mass Mocha, which is also up in yeah. um, North Adams. And uh, then the Eric Carle Museum down mm -hmm. in the valley yeah. is also popular. Uh, we have passes and Old Deerfield. Okay. Uh, Deerfield Historical Museums, uh, very generous. These museum passes, our friends fund most of them for us, ones that cost money. A couple of them are, are given to us free. 
and uh, they, you know, they are very generous once you get to the museum. I think it's just a great service. Yeah, we yeah. also have one from Smith College, and then every year uh, people probably, you know, don't realize that the uh, Massachusetts uh, Department of Parks and Conservation gives libraries two passes free, so that if you can't fund your own pass to go to the different parks, um, you can come and borrow it from the library. So you could borrow a pass. We have people borrow the pass and then go to the DAR in Goshen, for instance, mm -hmm. and then they don't have to pay the parking fee. That's just a great, great pass. service. Uh, on the other extreme of that, you also offer free eBooks, don't you? We so do. That you can download them from your yes. home computer and things. That's that's um, a new thing. I don't do that, but it's <laughs> it sounds sounds interesting. We have actually we're um, we are part of an automated network. Uh, CW Mars. Right. It covers the central and west. In fact, it means central and western Massachusetts automated resource sharing. Okay. And what that means is libraries like ours that can't afford to purchase all of those. It's ebooks and e audio books on uh, yeah. books that you can listen to cool. on any of your little devices. You can download them free from any of the CW Mars libraries, including ours. And uh, we can, our staff and any staff at the libraries can show somebody how to do that. Um, we're a little bit hampered here right now, but that will change because we actually don't have, we're not completely wired yet in town and we don't have internet access everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but we will. And people will be able to do this from, all, from their homes as well. Now, my understanding is that ebooks are very problematic in libraries, especially public libraries. Uh, the cost, uh, the number of times you can check them out. Are they, do they cause you a problem, or are they, do they make it easier to, to lend books out? Well, no. It, it, it's, it's part of the whole, the fact that we're um, getting the ebooks from publishing companies, and right. publishing companies are profit companies, and they want to make a profit. If they feel that if they allowed libraries to have ebooks and, and let anybody use them as much as they wanted to, that this would cut into their sales for yeah. both ebooks and regular books. And so, and libraries do have a problem with that. I mean, when we have a copy of a book, uh, once we purchase it, we can lend it as many times and as long as it will last. Yeah. With ebooks, the libraries and publishers have some friction and constant discussion and back and forth, I would say, go into argument as well, um, because libraries want to be able, it's our mission, to make them accessible um, to as much as possible and, and to have them free. We're free public libraries. And so, we, but then we run into publishers who want who put limits on the number of ebooks and also how ebooks can be downloaded? So it's a lot easier to go to bar, to any um, publisher and buy a book ebook than it is for libraries to download. There are there are, you know procedures put in place that we have to we have to um, educate people and know how to get through in order to get the ebooks. That said. Once people are a tr practice and have downloaded a couple of ebooks or a couple of audio books, mm -hmm. you know, people mm -hmm. listen to them, um, it, you know, when they're doing all kinds of things, um, then people really um, like them. And so it's just, it's a learning curve. There's a learning curve to using them. And we as librarians and library staff want to help people get through that learning curve to be able to use them. I'm, I'm glad that that's working out for you. I know that as a private citizen uh, following the cost of, of books, ebooks have gone up quite a bit in price. And I, I hear this because I have a bookstore. I hear this quite a bit that it's cheaper to buy a print, or you know, let's say a secondhand copy of a book, than, <laughs> at, at Gabriel Books, uh, than, than to buy the ebook. Ebooks uh, used to be 99 cents, now they're 12 99 and, and higher, uh, which is making the print book look you know, better, better again. Better. Plus, it's just a better reading experience. But I'm just really curious, and I'm trying to follow up myself as to, to where this is going to go. I don't like reading ebooks. I, I like the ease of getting them. I think it's great. Uh, but 
Uh, I just, I, I always have preferred a, a print copy, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, yeah, the younger generation is going to determine what happens. Yeah, that's true. And in that they, they, they actually, you know, so far, younger generation, the verdict is still out. People still seem to like books as yeah, well. Like a children's I book. I mean, this big illustrated yes, book, you can't exactly, do that. Exactly, exactly. And, and I uh, try and look at it not as a either or situation. It's a supplemental piece. So okay. that it's just so you read, there's no reason that reading any ebook should threaten anyone's reading experiences mm -hmm. I think it I has can, its place right? right that's right and for me there are three places that ebooks are good are really great mm -hmm. and I encourage people to use them one is when you travel you can take and, and I am one who yeah. used to struggle to figure out what five books I was going to take with me on vacation like right and you can take 20 books with you on vacation you yep. can also take some books yep. and then depending on where you're going download other books when you're traveling you're so it, right. it's a lot easier to take when you travel the other thing that I encourage people especially older people is that it gets really unwieldy a lot of people like to read in bed before they go to sleep and sometimes the, the books big books get unwieldy and having an e-reader to just turn the pages very easily and when you're going to sleep size, just even. and you can adjust yeah. the font size you can adjust the lighting on your mm -hmm. tablet and sometimes that can actually be a re easier before bed you know, like reading experience. Piece. you don't want to take one piece yeah. to bed and exactly. get it crushed by exactly. it exactly yeah. and you know they are writing their long huge fantasy books people like to read so I encourage people to just try it out for those particular situations I saw somebody reading an ebook recently and they had the, the the print was white and the back was black and I said what's going on with this she says, well I like to read at night in bed and it's easier to read to with read, white read. print and a black background I go I've got something I yeah learned. so we and the nice thing is with any with any mm -hmm. reader or tablet you can fool around with that and find out what works for you couple Big questions for you. What is the future of libraries? Where do you see libraries going? It sounds like you're keeping up with it. You you are the future. You aren't, uh, you know, looking back. You're looking at the future and moving. Absolutely. Into it. And yeah. and again, I see a combination of digital tools and a library, traditional library um, services and programming. I mean, I think that there's a lot that digital tools can do. For instance, where we have limited space here. There are, whereas on the computer, there are a couple, you were talking about ebooks, um, there are actually a couple of companies who have recognized that having unlimited access to books is, can actually benefit them. Mm. And so that I would love to see, um, to be able to, to raise the money kind to subscribe, kind of yes, idea. exactly, yeah. to the kind of, there's one for children's audio books where we can access unlimited, yeah. you know, have nice, unlimited access nice to children's audio books so that our, and we don't have the shelving to keep all those books, mm -hmm. but if everyone could access it, an audio book anytime Spotify they wanted to, that's things. right. Yeah. So those yeah. kind of things can really help, uh, um, uh, nourish and and expand people's reading experiences. I think and, authors and that's what we want. authors are yeah. probably pretty happy with that too because authors want to be read. That's they right. want to get paid. That's right. That's uh, right. But I think equal with that is. I want to reach people. I don't want my book to be unavailable That's so right. people can get to it. That's right. Now, the other piece is that we're looking toward in the future, and I think many libraries have already uh, gone in this direction, is to digitize their historical holdings. Okay. And that's something there's, um, there are a couple of very accessible free websites people can go to, one being Digital Library of America, um, right. and access these amazing um, pieces of history. Uh, memoirs and old diaries and primary sources that have that look like an actual book. They have actually mm -hmm. just digitized the book, so you can even get a little bit of a sense of the uh, texture of the material itself, as well as, of course, the valuable um, content. I'm really it. happy to hear that you're the first person, first librarian I've talked to that has mentioned the Digital Library of America, and that is uh, supposedly going to be the future for public libraries of uh, the, sh the shared resource nationwide. It, yeah. And is, is it part of the Library of Congress or is it separate? It's a whole separate thing? I'm not exactly sure okay. on that. Because the Library of Congress yeah. has but similar Library of Congress, things. exactly. It's, uh, a, it's our, it's our and, national and, depository. And get all of these yeah. uh, documents. Right. And, and it doesn't mean getting rid of the materials. We still have the materials sure. here, but it protects the materials and it, offer, off, it also allows access to so many people that couldn't get here to Ashfield to see the really specific things that we have in our historical collection that very few other people have.
Well, great. Well, thanks a lot for your time today, Martha. I really encourage everybody that's watching this to uh, to go to the Belding Memorial Library website to find out more about the library and when you're here in town to visit. And uh, thanks again. You're welcome. Thank We're you. going to take a tour of the library too. We're going to walk around and, and see some of the art and uh, and some of the movies and things that, that are available here. Martha, you were talking earlier uh, that one of the special things you have here is that you can loan out some of this beautiful art that you have on the walls. How does that work we, and who do you have? We do. We have a small collection of Ashfield artists. Um, the, uh, the collection was um, given to the, or, or it was started in honor of the father of one of our residents. Um, and Diana Bennett helped set up the uh, collection. And the collection is 15 or so, uh, mostly paintings, but artworks by Ashfield artists. And anyone in Ashfield or the local area can come and pick up one of these paintings. These are three by uh, Mimi Piropan. And we have maybe um, nine or so artists that have created our 15 pieces. And you could borrow them for eight weeks at a time. They Each one has a nice wooden carrying case that protects it. And you pick it up here in Ashfield, take it, hang it in your home, and then bring it back in up to eight weeks. I think that that's um, really great that you have it so locally focused. That, yes. that really is a, is a great service. I, I, when you first told me about this, I pictured you know reproductions and things, but this is the real deal. These are real. Yes, it's colors. real artwork. Yeah, it's the originals. And we have them around the library when they're not borrowed so that people can actually, it's, it's our little local art exhibit that's uh, our permanent collection. Great. Let's take a walk around the library and see some of the other things that you have. Another thing that uh, we were talking about earlier is uh, the Ashfield Film Festival. Um, you guys are the archive for this. What, what have you got there in your hands? Well, the Ashfield Film Festival started in uh, 2007, um, and it was a, it's a short film festival. The films all have to be five minutes or less, and they don't have to be done by Ashfield folks. And this is something that uh, that this Harry will be and Tamsin, inspiring to NCTV they, watchers. <laughs> that's right. But they do have to touch on something related to Ashfield. Okay. And w every year they encourage folks to to come up and and. In, put films into the collection. So this is the very first one, and um, these are the folks who started it, and this, it is, like you mentioned, uh, uh, dedicated to Cecil B. DeMille, who was, again, born in Asheville, and Baby Cecil is this. There's a lot the of humor and creativity mm. and out-of-the-box thinking that goes into this film festival. And now it draws, um, when it happens in September every year, they show the films, they have popcorn, and then they vote. The, it's a people's audience uh, vote on you know best for different kinds of film awards and now, the awards are made by Asheville artists. No, I understand you yeah. starred in a, in a film recently that was made by some <laughs> local kids you were yeah. abducted by aliens. That's right, that's how, right. How much fun I was that? My little scream. Ah! It was a lot of fun. And you, you find people with cameras walking around Asheville during the year, especially you know during the summer, um, making films to be part of the festival. And what were you saying? Oh, so I was, you see people walking around in the summer and, and uh, with cameras all over town saying, and the library is in a lot, people, a lot of people have come in and say, oh, can I film this and that? Usually they don't want me in it, so it was kind of fun to be in that Aliens film, but they want the library as a piece of, again, a piece of the community. A lot, as I say, a lot of times people use the library steps, but this was this year's and we keep here at the library, we're probably the only library with a collection, complete collection, of all of the years of the Film Fest. So the Film Fest directors um, generously donate two or three copies of the Film Fest shorts, and uh, they are one of our popular collections. People take them out and um, watch them, and this is uh, this year's. Just are any of these on YouTube or are they online anywhere? Well, I believe they are on YouTube because you found the uh, aliens in the library. Um, yeah, that so might I'm have been not... made by some NCTV related people. Oh, okay. That might be why we have it. Yeah, there. I don't think the whole festival is yeah. on YouTube. I think that we the whole festival, the only place that you can find it, is on 
on the CD, the DVD that's developed by the. Uh, you can okay. buy it here in town at Elmer's, or you can, can you borrow do, it from the library. Can you get to uh, look at these? You no. know, I believe I think we could probably arrange that, if okay. folks. Yes. All right. So that. that's something to note, all you NCTV viewers, that uh, if you want to see these short films, get some inspiration for your seven-minute film <laughs> fest that we do. <laughs> you might want to come up here and watch these. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Martha. Let's, let's see. Uh, your room with uh, your founders. Okay. And then we... Who do we have here, Martha? It's uh, quite a gallery. This is Mary Wilson Belding, Milo Belding's mother, who is one of the two people that the library is, was given to the town in honor of. And her husband, Hiram, is right here. And he happens to be the cheeriest looking photo we have in the room. We were joking uh, that he is portrait, the, I mean, the most joyful is... New England Victorian ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No grim, grim reapers here. And over here is Milo himself, um, distinguished by that mustache. Yes, heroic yes. mustache. Milo building the silk manufacturer. Great. This is really cool to get to see these. Yeah. And this is the community room here. This, this is the community room down this here. This is open to really uh, nice daylight basement. Open for use by any. Um, local resident for cultural, civic, and educational purposes. Nice little room. Well, this is our uh, newly emerging history room, uh, local uh, and re regional history. Um, we have uh, had a wonderful volunteer helping us catalog our historical materials. And um, in the future, these are the materials that we hope to digitize. Um, particularly our ephemeral material here and uh, then we have many copies of Asheville histories and genealogy research our historical society is not open during the winter and is only open on Saturdays during the summer so many of these materials are the only historical pieces that are available to access most of the time and so we do have um, historical researchers and genealogists using some of these which is really nice. Yeah. We also, you can see where this is just our, um, again, our Asheville histories that are for sale for $40. <laughs> I think our, it's the most handsome book I've seen in a long time. It is lovely. And here is our, the copy of the Emancipation Proclamation that was given to the library last year during its centennial. And uh, we, we actually eventually hope to have that um, in a more readable place, uh, this wall. But, we were very happy to accept that. Well, Martha, thanks for this tour and thanks for your time and thanks for this history of Asheville. It's a very interesting town. I think our viewers are going to be thrilled to find out more about it. Well, thank you, John, for your interest. I appreciate it.